I've just been very, I've just been very lucky to um, to have been in the right place at the right time. So my work mostly stemmed from working at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, in the chemistry office. So my brother likes to refer me as refer to me as Aaron Brockovich of the sea. So I literally started there and and that that working in an office led to working with scientists that was enabled me to do the work that I've been doing for the past 12 years. So without further ado, I will take you down some of that journey with my PowerPoint. And mind you, it's gonna be uh, pretty much, oh, sorry, all over the place um, because my work has taken me all over the place. So um, the name of my talk is Save Our Seas, Save Ourselves. And, and no time have we ever figured out how important it is to get a handle on this plastic issue. I think now more than ever because of COVID. So we were all locked in our houses. We knew that if we ate at any restaurants, everything was gonna be packaged a lot more in plastics, a lot more plastic bags being used, et cetera. And it, and it brought a huge awareness to people, especially on what they were seeing on the side of the road. Part of that was because the DOT wasn't out there doing the cleanups um, because they were also in lockdown. So we began to really recognize here locally as well as state and countrywide that this problem is, is really um, becoming to the forefront. Here's some of the statistics that we really need to hone in on before we start any of this conversation. And, and most of you I know are aware that plastic is made out of petroleum and natural gas. And you know, you'd be surprised how many people don't know that. So just statistics that were done in 2017, we use about 20 million barrels of oil per day in this country. And 6% of that is used to make plastics. So that's about 1.2 million barrels a day. So not gallons, but barrels. And so when we talk about this plastic issue, it, it hits so many different levels and one being offshore drilling. So sadly, because, well, the good news is we're now moving away from combustion engines. In fact, China is no longer taking combustion engines over their border. There's a huge movement globally to go with electric cars and such. The writing is on the wall for the oil industry. And so they are now working with the plastics and chemical industry to increase plastic production by 40% within the next 10, uh, 10 years. And that has already begun. So $180 billion spent on increasing plastic production. So when we think about that one piece of plastic, we're like, eh, it's just one piece of plastic. Think about how this whole movement in increasing production is being steered. Meanwhile, there's so many of us like, like your organization and mine that are trying to educate people that we need to stop using so much of it. So a plastic production has increased um, by, by uh, 20 fold since the 50s. And, um, and there's other things that have happened that would follow the same, the same flow, right? So we've got uh, extinction rates. You can overlay the same graph with extinction rates, cancer rates, and I'm going to get into some of that. So while this plastic is increasing, we're seeing a decline in, in, in um, the natural world, and plastic is playing a major role in those extinctions. So just a little bit about my nonprofit Plastic Ocean Project. Uh, it started out of research that I, as I had mentioned, at a UNCW. That research took me nearly 10,000 nautical miles to these gyre circulation systems. As you can see by this image, it is not a series of oceans, but it's actually one ocean that is linked together by currents. And these currents have certain boundaries that are established, mostly because the equatorial current. 
So there's uh, these gyre circulation systems in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. There are five major ones. North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. I have been to four of the five. So my research was predominantly looking for plastics inside these circulation systems thousands of miles away from land. And after seeing some pretty horrific sights while spending a month at sea in various locations, I recognized that I wasn't going to just write my thesis and defend it, but I was actually going to have to start a nonprofit to really combat this horrible issue. So we fundamentally focus on education through research, outreach through art, and solutions through collaboration. So what was I doing out in the middle of these gyres? Well, we, we use a uh, mantatrol, which is uh, usually used for uh, studying plankton. So it's a new stun net. Uh, it has holes in it so small you couldn't put a straight pin through. And we, um, we run this uh, instrument for approximately 15 minutes to an hour at about two knots. And what we're mostly finding in these gyre regions is more like a plastic soup. So when you hear the island of trash, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, but it's, if, if we were to call it an island, I would call it an inverted island. Because while I was out in these ocean regions, we would, we would see small pieces of plastic just barely breaking the surface that might be actually a 55 gallon drum or a 200 pound net. So these plastics are hanging in the water column. And one of the reasons why you know, people say, take pictures, well, you can't unless you were to go underneath and, and shoot upward. But predominantly what we're finding are these microplastics. And the real curse of that, as you probably know, is that the smaller these particles break up into, the more bioavailable it is for plankton all the way up to blue whales. Now I'm gonna show you this short clip because before I got on a 50 foot catamaran with Captain Charles Moore to sail across the North Pacific garbage patch, I had gone down to Camilo Beach. It's considered one of the dirtiest beaches in the world, not in some developing nation, but actually in Hawaii. And this beach was predominantly a lava beach. So very little sand, except for plastic sand. And I'm just gonna run a little bit of this so that you can see what I witnessed before I started my journey. And it was really standing here that I realized that I don't wanna see Riceville Beach end up like this. And once this starts, you cannot stop it. So I'll just run this video for a little bit. Pure plastic, not a bit of sand, big black ball, little natural stuff there. Look at this, inches thick. Hey, there's a toothbrush. Did you forget your toothbrush? Look at this handful of plastic. That's what Charlie calls confetti. So um, while that's happening, while uh, due to runoff, 80% of the plastic that ends up in the ocean is coming from runoff. Um, we have now other issues that are also increasing the amount of debris ending up in our oceans, as you know, these horrible storms. So we know that from Hurricane Florence, there was so much flooding, people's houses had to be uh, completely moved outside and then to the landfill. So that only increases buying and making of more plastic stuff but it also provides an opportunity for more of the stuff that's in the house to be then in the environment. And then also what happens with these storms, whatever's on the side of the road has the potential to end up in rivers and um, end up into the ocean. So the, we are now at this uh, very important juncture where we have this feedback loop, right? So this, these storms are now actually increasing the amount of stuff that we're buying as well as how much stuff is ending up in the environment. So um, what I wanna share with you right now is you know, just the 
types of attention that this plastic issue is getting. So I have been to the Dominican Republic. I had seen what the beaches look like in certain areas. People don't even go to the beach because it's so littered with trash. This is after a storm. So when there's rain, unfortunately, they have very poor infrastructure. So once um, it starts raining, it's washing this debris down into the ocean, of which then it becomes everyone's problem, right? So some of this debris actually we could see uh, coming up from the Gulf Stream. <laughs> So that's what we find on the surface. Well, this is another video, again, from Indonesia, so other parts of the world, where we're really starting to see this problem accumulate. And this was one of the biggest challenges when you're doing research on plastics, not all plastics float. And so some of it will sink to the bottom and some of it will hang in the water column, making it more dangerous for all species in the ocean. So I'll just run a short bit of this. In an underwater paradise, a plastic nightmare. Diver Rich Horner just days ago filming stunning images, searching for fish, but finding an ocean of plastic trash. So you've probably seen documentaries, including the one that I was in called A Plastic Ocean on Netflix. There's a lot of documentaries being expressed about this plastic crisis. But when do we ever talk about it in the North Atlantic? We rarely see any stories about it unless it's an entangled whale or a sea turtle that's ingested plastic. And I'm here to talk to you about the research that I've been doing in the North Atlantic and why it could potentially be even a larger threat for our marine life in the North Atlantic. And part of that is because we have this very unique algae known as sargassum. And this sargassum serves as an essential fish habitat. This is where a lot of our juvenile fish go to forage for food as well as for protection, as well as our sea turtles. So you can see in these images how this plastic will accumulate in the sargassum. You can see like the, the beautiful blue ocean, you don't really see anything, but mostly in the sargassum. Now, why that's happening is because the sargassum propagates on the surface. In other words, it's not tethered to the bottom of the ocean. So it's free floating and being driven by wind and current. And some of these sargassum mats can get up to be seven, eight miles long. And same things that influence the sargassum is what influences the plastic and therefore the plastic is driven right into the sargassum or known as the essential fish habitat. So some of the work that we've been doing for our film project that I'll talk about later is working with uh, fishermen. So we actually hire charter fishermen to take us offshore so that we can study this plastic problem. And of course, we're looking at the sargassum. And through the research that we've been doing over the past dozen years and recognizing that this, the sargassum is completely getting mired with plastic, we decided that we would start a film that would discuss how this plastic could actually be more detrimental to our animals in the North Atlantic. So um, this is just the surface of this one particular patch. And this is not to say that every single patch of sargassum looks like this, but there, there are ranges of how much plastic, but I will tell you that we always find plastic in the sargassum mats. Now here's an example of why that's important. So this is underneath the sargassum mat. As I had mentioned, this is an essential fish habitat. There are actually 81 vertebrates unique to the sargassum. In other words, they have adapted to the sargassum and you won't find them anywhere else. And that, those are shrimps, uh, certain types of fish, histrio histrio, which actually has adapted its fins so it can hold onto the sargassum and actually ambush prey. Um, 
And so there's plenty of food that's part of the sargassum as well as what relies on it. So uh, last year we had Captain Charles Moore here. Um, he's the founder of Algalita Marine Research Foundation. He's the one I sailed across the North Pacific with. And as, uh, as I started doing my work in the North Atlantic, I decided to invite him into the North Atlantic so he could experience it. This is him trying to collect plastic that he's finding in the sargassum. And when he climbed on our boat, and this is a man that's been doing research on plastic for 20 years, he said, I have never in my life seen anything as tragic as this. So again, like what we were seeing in the video with Bali, we are seeing the same thing happen here. It's just not getting the attention. And that's why we really need to focus on ways to educate people about what's happening here as well because we have this false sense of security that this plastic problem is in Asia, it's in the North Pacific, it's over there and everything is fine here. So this is why the work that we're doing through Plastic Ocean Project is so important. We really need to get people on the continental rim of the North Atlantic to recognize that we have a serious problem here as well and we can do better. So another or other reasons why we really should care. So through this research that took me out to all these gyres and out in the middle of the ocean, it was the sargassum that led me right back to North Carolina. I learned that sargassum accumulates off our coast and through learning about the sargassum and being able to take students instead of out into the middle of the ocean where there's a huge carbon footprint, I can take them offshore and we can study plastic and the sargassum and the animals that rely upon it. I learned that it accumulates off the coast of Hatteras. And Hatteras happens to be one of the most biologically rich locations in the country, if not in the world. And there are scientists right now that are learning more and more about this region and why it's incredibly vital. But here are 16 reasons why our coast is important and 16 reasons why we should really try to do better with this plastic situation. These are 16 endangered species that we find off of our coast on the reg. So uh, just a quick overview of you know, why we should care, right? So we've got about a million seabirds that are dying every year from plastic ingestion entanglement and an estimated 300,000 marine mammals. Um, so we really need to be thinking about what's happening to them, but also what is it, what is it doing to the food web? So as these plastics break up into smaller and smaller pieces, research that we have done, we have proven that plankton will eat certain plastics and in some cases prefer the plastics over their um, food. So as the plankton is eating plastics, it works its way up the food web. And as Dana had mentioned, the research we were doing with NOAA, we were actually able to prove that though black sea bass are less likely to eat plastics, they will eat the organisms that are eating the plastics and the chemicals that go along with those plastics. And then those chemicals work their way up the food web. But if we don't care about that, uh, this is really where Plastic Ocean Project is moving in, in a direction of really understanding the chemicals that are in plastics. And according to a report that came out in 2018 by the American Academy of Pediatrics, there are certain plastics, and I will say all plastics, but some are worse than others, are, have chemicals that are endocrine disrupting. Your endocrine system manages every single cell in your body. And the Academy was saying that because children's metabolisms run much faster, they're much more impacted by these chemical compounds. And in this report, they went so far as to say, these chemicals are linked to diabetes, obesity, cancer, behavioral disorders, and re reproductive issues. And so this really, to me, is something that we have got 
to hone in on, that there are very few uh, regulations on plastics. And in fact, this report states that we really haven't been looking at the chemicals in plastics since, since the 80s. So I threw this in here because I think this is part of the crux of the problem. In other countries, they have the precautionary principle where companies have to prove that their chemicals are not toxic before they can put, be put on the market. And if they are proven to be, they are removed from the market until they can make them safer. Now, this is, uh, this is the American Chemistry Council's answer to the chemical problem. You can see where they're going put it on the EPA, have our tax dollars pay to make sure these chemicals are safe, right? And this is the, because of the strong lobby groups they have in our government, they have a much larger voice. And this is how we are dealing with these chemicals. And as you know, with what we're dealing with, with the Cape Fear River, it's not working. So um, when, when industry talks about uh, one part per billion, they will describe it that it's really if 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 one part per billion was uh, one pancake, it would be one pancake in a stack of pancakes four miles high, right? But meanwhile, with a Nuva ring, is zero point zero three five parts per billion, and it can prevent conception up to ninety nine percent. So these plastics are actually having a negative impact on humans from extraction to refining to consumption and waste management. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the waste management side. So now we know why there is an SOS and why we need to find our way out. So I do have some good news. And that is, there's some legislation that's in the House right now. It's the Break Free from Plastic uh, Act. And this was actually something that started with Greenpeace. And they've been an incredible force. And we now have several politicians that have signed on to pushing this through. So we really have to get a handle on it. I'm not gonna read this to you, but you can see that there's an enormous amount of effort on how to get a handle on the plastic crisis. Some other really great things that have uh, come forward and that's our Save Our Seas Act. So now we're also trying to address what's happening in the environment, in our oceans, and then working with other countries to help them with their waste management. And then probably the, the greatest news, and this is most recent, is that internationally, we now have the UN Global Plastic Pollution Treaty. Uh, this is something that hasn't happened since 1987 when we put the MARPOL Act into effect uh, internationally. So making it illegal to dump any plastic in the ocean. And that has seemed to help according to work that was done by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. So there is hope. So then what is Plastic Ocean Project doing? Well. One of the things that we're focusing on is this, right? So um, I, I, I wish we had an audience because I would certainly ask you, you know, when did the three R's start? And so I can tell you that it started around 1985. And remember this chart? So here we can see 1985. And has the three R's have any impact on the plastics? I would dare say not. And partly because every bit of it has to do with this plastic that we've been told was recyclable is not for the most part. So we have to come up with a new paradigm and the chasing arrow arrows have to be in circularity. We have to figure out a way to rein in the chemicals that are in these plastics so that we can make them more recyclable. And then we have to build the infrastructure in order to allow these materials to be repurposed. So I'm working with a company up in Raleigh called More Recycling, and they do all the statistical analysis on where these plastics are leaking out, why the recycling system currently is not working, and how we can figure out the best solution to recycling. 
So some of the things that uh, have been brought to our attention and why it's not working is the, the supply and demand chain. So um, the virgin plastic industry has figured out um, how they can still make a profit and eke out underneath the uh, what can be sold for the recycled material. So in other words, the recycled content is more expensive than vir virgin plastics. And therefore, of course, companies have to worry about their bottom line. They're going to purchase the, um, the virgin plastics over the recycled plastics. We pay some of the highest uh, per capita for landfill in developed nations, and partly because we throw away more stuff than other developed countries. Other countries have implemented uh, compost as well as better recycling systems, and we have not. So what Plastic Ocean Project has been doing is working with some legislators um, to work on this Blue New Deal coalition concept, where we're also working with folks from the IMF, as well as um, other uh, lobby groups in order to help on this recycling issue. So what we propose is that there will be subsidies given to recycling. So for example, the IMF came out with a report that the oil and gas industries uh, receive over a trillion dollars a year in subsidies. So some of that money should be mandated to the back end of the plastic crisis, and that money could subsidize recycling. We need to come up with better catchment devices for our storm drains, which would mean creating more jobs because those would have to be managed. We could uh, provide perks for waste reduction. So companies that decide to use the recycled content could maybe even get some um, uh, perks as far as uh, uh, tax breaks. Um, we could even tax companies that are using virgin plastics. And then as I have mentioned, we are working on creating stricter laws on chemicals that are used in plastics. And you can learn more about this on our Blue New Deal website. Um, after uh, Hurricane Florence, we lost our science building on campus and Plastic Ocean Project was operating out of about eight different locations in Dobo Hall. And that meant we had to scurry to find our own location. So we now have this really nice space uh, just next door to the university. Uh, it's within walking distance for our students. We were able to acquire a fume hood as well as a flow hood, as well as a $100,000 instrument that can detect plastic particles down to 10 micron. So this is giving us a whole new opportunity for students to really study plastics in an environment where they're actually taking what they're learning in the classroom and applying it to a real world problem. And one of those problems that I have students working on, in fact, I have 11 interns this summer working on the NC Riverkeeper research samples where they're sending us uh, grab samples. These, as you can see in the left, they just look like plain old water. Uh, these are waters from different watersheds around uh, North Carolina. We then have students using a fume hood to digest any of the natural debris that may be in there. And then we transfer it over to our laminar hood, which is a hood that uh, uh, mitigates any contaminants that might be in the open air. Uh, we then take the, those filters and then we use our instrument to look for any plastic particles. And on the very right, you can see the spectra that this instrument is allowed to do. So basically it can find the particles, it can analyze the particles, and then it can spit out a report uh, basically saying what percentage of that material, what it, what it looks like. Now that is not to say that it's just push a button and go, we de definitely have to have chemists on board. And the, the image that I'm showing you right now, it came up as being cocaine. 
We did not find cocaine in the river. So what we have to do is tease out what that spectrum matches to in different for different materials. So the very bottom spectra, that is actually polyethylene. So we were able to determine that that, that particle was actually a plastic particle. So it does require in some cases for us to dive down and really figure out what the instrument's reading and then how these plastics look when they start to degrade. So this research that we're doing, not only with the river keepers, but also with NC State, we're actually learning what plastics look like as they degrade and their chemistry actually changes. So we're now going to hopefully create a library since right now only thing that's available is what plastics look like when they're virgin plastics. This is going to expedite science in a whole new level because we will have a database that we can share with other researchers on what plastics look like through the degradation process. Other things that we have looked at is BPA-free bottles. The student wanted to know what they were substituting the BPA with. Uh, so she had uh, her control, which was not subject to a UV light or heat. And then she had one in the sun and one in a hot dishwasher. When she analyzed her data, all three of these plastics released acrylonitrile, which is a known carcinogen and um, so that's the, so though she did not find any BPA or BPS, which is one of the substitutes, we did find a host of other chemicals that we should all be concerned about. So while we're thinking, yay, this is a BPA free plastic bottle, there's more than likely other chemicals that you should be concerned about in that plastic. Uh, as Dana had mentioned, we've been working on plastics to fuel and we are incredibly impressed with what we're capable to do with just a tabletop reactor. So we have analyzed it from just about every aspect because we wanna make sure that this isn't gonna be a quick fix and cause another environmental problem. We see this as a great solution for island nations. Uh, as I had showed with the Dominican Republic, this waste actually has a high BTU value. So if we could turn this plastic into something that people could actually value, then it would less likely end up in the environment. And that's what we hope to do with this technology. And then uh, another project we started back in 2018 after Hurricane Florence was our Trees for Trash in initiative. And I have this short video I'm gonna run with it. Hurricane Florence. It rained on Wilmington for three days. It rained three feet of rain. And what that did was it loosened up a lot of our old growth trees. We ended up losing tens of thousands of trees from just one storm. These storms are now taking on two issues, right? Marine debris and the loss of the trees. We figured if we could create an initiative that would address both by making a number of Every 25 pounds of trash we remove from the environment, we would plant one tree. We could then take what doesn't belong in the environment and put back what does. Plastic Ocean Project doesn't know how to plant trees. We don't know anything about trees, but we know how to clean up trash and we know where to find those locations. That meant we had to coordinate with other nonprofits in the area. So like the Alliance for Keep Your Trees was one of them that we partnered with. Most recently, we had the North Carolina Wildlife Federation step up and say that they want to partner with us. And so between a very large nonprofit organization and Plastic Ocean Project, we're building a consortium that can bring in anyone that really cares about this state to take on planting trees and picking up trash. And that makes me very hopeful about the success of this program. The Trees for Trash Initiative. And another wonderful initiative that we're doing is our Ocean Friendly Establishments that was actually started by Ginger Taylor. 
uh, we just offered to facilitate her creative idea and it has now grown to over 250 uh, ocean friendly establishments, not only here in North Carolina, but in other parts of the country. So it's uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, check it out. It has its own website as well as it's on our website. So plasticoceanproject.org under current initiatives. And basically what it is, is giving those companies and those businesses that are making an effort to reduce their use of waste, uh, the opportunity to get some kind of status. And by doing so, we're able to get people to look for ocean-friendly establishments in order to support such businesses. So check it out, see our list, and then be sure to, to sponsor them because they're trying really hard, especially during COVID. One other uh, fantastic thing that has come out of the work that Plastic Ocean Project has done, and that is, as I had mentioned, the work I was doing with students, taking them offshore, finding these sargassa mats, and in the process, discovering that we have this very rich biodiverse location off the coast of North Carolina. Um, in 2015, Sylvia Earle's foundation put out a documentary called Mission Blue. And in it, there was a request to um, establish hope spots around the world. And taking the information that uh, was collected by the US Navy, as well as uh, UNCW, we were able to put together a, a proposal to have Hope Spot Hatteras established. And in 2016, out of over 200 applicants, Hope Spot Hatteras became one of 17. And we're continuing to work on that. In fact, we're probably going to even expand the size of our Hope Spot. And so then with all this wonderful information that I just shared with you, and especially trying to get people to understand what's happening in the North Atlantic, especially this very biodiverse location off of our coast, how can we tell this story? And we decided that in order to do so, we would uh, create a documentary called If the Ocean Could Talk. And you know, one thing about science is that it oftentimes just stays within the science community. It doesn't work its way out to the general public, the, the people that really need to know what's happening. And so we decided, and as one of our legs, for our nonprofit, so education through research, outreach through art, we decided to use the took him out on the open ocean so that he could play his music and we could video record this absolutely beautiful scenery with the sounds of whales. And of course, um, even the captain that took us out and did this cried. It was so emotionally beautiful. So this documentary is going to highlight all the biodiversity that can be affected not only by plastics, but also the noise, the shipping, and the sonar, and all of the insults that we're creating on this ocean, and then what each and every one of us can do to stop it. And it's going to be a Save the Whales 2.0. Um, and I'll show you that video or the trailer if you're interested, but um, I'll get back to that. So what can we do as individuals? I know that I'm preaching to the choir because I, I thoroughly understand my audience. And so it's, it doesn't uh, fall lightly on your shoulders that what we need to do. So I just came up with this, be wise shoppers, right? And we know that we have to be more conscious about what we're buying globally. You know, we think about those ships, the ship noise, all the shipping that's going on across this North Atlantic the ship strikes that are happening to our whales and sea turtles, et cetera. Um, we could reduce that by just doing these few things, right? So do it yourself. Um, my daughter actually taught me how to make my own laundry soap. 
and it lasts an entire year. It's like four ingredients and I just mix it up as I go and I don't need to buy any uh, plastic container. Um, buy bars of soap. I'm sure most of you do this now, but you know when you think about the bottled body wash, it's mostly you're paying for the bottle and the water. So um, really good idea. And plus we have such great soap makers in our community, it's great to support them. And then as I had mentioned with our ocean friendly establishment, you know, make sure that we're supporting our local businesses, especially those that focus on sustainability. And one question I always ask an audience is, you know, how many of you recycle and every hand goes up. But when I ask how many actually look for recycled content when they're buying stuff, and the numbers drop substantially. So be mindful that when you're buying anything that's packaged to look to see if there's any of the same thing that's in any kind of recycled content. Because we can't just throw stuff in the recycle bin and not find a market for it. So the more we buy recycled materials, the, the more value it has. And then I always like to say that this is all in our hands, right? If, if we don't use it, we can't lose it. And then democracy is a participatory sport, right? So, and I know, you know, your group is absolutely wonderful at using your voice. Um, and so I just like to remind people that that's one of the best things we have going for us. I was told that our, our legislators only need to hear from about 25 people on the same issue for it to gain their attention really important to write letters to companies if you um, like their packaging, as well as letting them know when you don't. So Snapple was one of them that switched from glass to plastics. And there was a huge outcry for them to you know, bring back the glass. Um, and so not that they have done it completely, but there are still glass Snapples out on the market. And then um, I always encourage people to visit your waste management website to see what's the latest and greatest in the recycling world. Uh, our local recycling facility used to take number five. So that would be like your yogurt containers and such. They're no longer taking them. So whenever we throw stuff in the recycle bin that will not be recycled, we're actually um, miring the whole process. So just being mindful what you put in there. And also an interesting fact that I learned is that you should never put anything smaller than a post-it note in the recycle bin. So think about all of that stuff that's not being recycled. And with that, I will say thank you so much for being here and I'd love to take any questions. And then if anyone's interested in watching the trailer for um, If the Ocean Could Talk, I can show that as well. I think I'm just gonna make a an executive decision and ask you to play it <laughs> oh i love it okay great awesome okay let me just go here okay good I love thinking about the birds singing their higher pitched songs up in the trees, while far below the ocean surface, whales are singing a similar song, just at a slower speed and at a lower pitch. One part of me is amazed by this connection, while the other just thinks, of course they're connected. Everything in nature is connected. Whales are highly dependent on sound for their navigation and communication. On the other hand, whales have been highly limited to what man-made sounds they've heard. 
insatiable human demands for stuff endlessly shipped across the ocean surface collide with their need to breathe. Filling the oceans with noise and plastic waste. Ubiquitous plastic trash confused for food. Man-made chemicals that find their way into marine mammals' mother's milk. I think it's safe to say that whales rarely have the opportunity to hear man-made sounds that are beautiful. I believe that whales would be curious, excited, and interested to hear more music from us. I want to share with them that not all of our human activities are destructive. People have been trying to save the whales for decades. I want to learn their struggles in hopes to communicate their story. I am in search of answers to the ocean calling. Could it be that whales are saving us? Stop sharing. That was beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> you have me crying, Bonnie. <laughs> uh, so good to see you. I couldn't, really, I couldn't really speak for a minute there. Hold on, I get my video back. Um, Okay, well, it is, we are open for questions now. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Bonnie, for sharing all of that. Um, you know, it's a heavy topic all the time, but it's so great that, you know, you peppered it with some good news and, and all of the things, all of the great things that Plastic Ocean Project is doing. Um, and so thank you for all of that. So I'm gonna open it up to questions. Please unmute yourself and feel free to fire away. Go ahead, uh, Betty. I just have w one little comment uh, to be careful when you talk about recycling not having a great impact because there are people who are not interested in recycling that will take that as, well, I don't have to recycle anymore because it doesn't do any good. Yes, and, and that's why I always encourage people the important the important takeaway is that you can't just throw all plastic in the recycle bin. I that, understand yeah. that. Okay. Having been recycling since 1985, I understand that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for the advice. Go ahead, Valerie. Hi. I have a, I guess, a litter question. I've always been curious um, well, why we have so much trash in Burnt Mill Creek, just a couple of blocks from me and such. Do we have any idea what percentage of uh, plastics that wind up in our waterways is from people littering? Does it fall off the recycling or garbage trucks? I, I mean, I know a lot of it is large-scale commercial stuff gone awry, but... but um, what, how, how much of a role does just plain old littering play? Yeah, it, it's a very large role. You know, it, it doesn't stay put, right? So whenever it's windy, it's blowing these plastics. Um, so it's definitely littering. But I will say that the work we've been doing on um, 421, Route 421, so every month we go out, and we clean the same 1,000 foot stretch, the exact same stretch. And we collect anywhere from 200 to 400 pounds of trash. And in one, one month, we collected over 700. So we've got a real issue with not only um, businesses not covering their load, 
but it's also coming off of the trucks that are transporting our waste. And I know this because I've witnessed it with my own eyes. So we were taking a load of, of what we collected from our 421 cleanup and I had a student with me and uh, we noticed like this big chunk of styrofoam in the middle of the road. And we're like, wow, that just happened because there's so much traffic, it would have been you know, run over by now. And then as we were sitting there, we we're watching plastic bags, cardboard, like just stuff flying. It was literally raining trash. And so I sped up to find out, you know, what truck was losing this stuff. And it was actually a municipality truck. So it's, it's not just, you know, people, but it's also that, that needs to be rained in. It was one of those nice, bright, beautiful new green trucks that we have picking up our trash. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering if it's a design issue, like, you know, it has a door that shuts, but is there trash that's getting caught in between where the door shuts? And so it like the wind is blowing it out if it's not inside where that, that door latches shut. Um, it was just a thought that I had. I did report it to Joe Sullivan at the landfill. And he said that he agreed he was noticing it more too. So it's, it's kind of everyone and it's all of us, right? So like if we use it, and that's why I say if we, that we have the potential of losing it, even though we put it in our waste bin, meanwhile, you know, they come and pick it up, but it, you know, some of our stuff could be ending up on the side of the road and then it gets into rivers and creeks and then it just is gonna make its way to the ocean. Um, there are some areas that are worse than others. And some of that has to do with the morphology of that location. So when I showed that video of Camilo Beach in Hawaii, mm -hmm. that beach is, has a very unique uh, design where it's a Bay Area. It's also on the lee side of the island. It has this prevailing current as well as winds. And so stuff just washes in in that location. It just, it, and it's not the same if you go another, you know, 500, Yard, not yards, but a mile up the road. You're not going to see the same thing. And and it's the same thing with Wrightsville Beach. Wrightsville Beach is one of the cleanest beaches you'll ever vi visit, and partly because of its morphology as well. Uh, the Cape Fear River banks to the right when it goes out, so like the uh, Wrightsville Beach is protected, right? It's not going to get so much of that debris flowing onto the beach that's coming off of the river. Um, so that has something to do with it. And, you know, you're not the first person to mention this site to me. And I would love to, you know, do some research on trying to figure that out. You know, maybe set up some cameras or something where we could actually see how this flow is happening. What is it exactly that's driving so much debris in that particular location? Because there is a lot. And I'll just share, Valerie, the project that Bonnie was talking about with the, uh, the North Cal with the, Co the Carolina Waterkeepers um, our piece is Burnt Mill Creek, so we so um, we're doing the the research. Audrey and Kemp, or they're not doing the research; they're doing the grads and sending them over to Bonnie um, to get the the at least the numbers on plastic there. Um, and then the goal there is to eventually put in a little litter gitter, which is you know to me it's unfortunate that that's where we're at that we have to actually get to the point of putting in something to trap pollution instead of just you know having people not pollute. But um, it it's that we'll watch that and see and 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 see afterwards how how much um, it it reduces the at least the plastic and and some of the other trash in there. I think Frederick had his hand up. Do you have a question, Frederick? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you for that great talk, Bonnie. I thank just <laughs> I just wanted to um, I, I have a pet peeve, uh, and that is fruit stickers. I hate those things. <laughs> yes. Here I am trying to trying to compost my my fruit, you know, my 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 waste and, in my backyard, and I have to work really hard to to take little bits of plastic and prevent little bits of plastic from getting into my compost. Sorry to rant there. No, I agree with you, <laughs> and and it's so frustrating, you know, because it, it, you have to remember to take them off. Uh, my daughter is the the food sticker Nazi. She, you know, like if I throw something in there and I don't notice it, she'll be like, um, "They are atrocious." And I I think didn't we used to use some kind of like dye? Didn't they stamp food with, with a dye back in like the seventies? It used to be clerks in stores actually looked up or actually knew knew the prices. Knew the numbers. Of, yeah, it was they, they like knew it was... how much each you know piece of fruit cost per pound. Right. <laughs> but right. Uh, I guess they're they're trying to save money and and hire lower 
paid in people, I suppose. I don't know. I've well, seen photos from other countries where <laughs> it looks as if the lemon has been stamped mm -hmm. rather yes. than stickered. Yes. And I, I think believe, that could be a great workaround. I do believe that those stickers as well are actually coated in a little bit of PFAS on the top, uh, just just for flavor. Um, <laughs> I, I, and, and, I, and I hate to interrupt and, and throw out my, my, uh, my pet peeve, but I think this is a great opportunity to request and suggest to those who are not doing this, please don't wrap your plastic produce or your produce in a plastic bag. I mean, it showed up from wherever it started, not in a plastic bag. It landed on that shelf, not in a plastic bag. You putting it in a plastic bag at the end of the trip is not going to clean it in any way. Um, and so that to me, I just, I'm like, I always get so angry when people just pile in their plastic bags and put their apple in a plastic bag. Sorry, I'm off my trip. Um, Bridget has her hand up. Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions. One or one ob observation, because um, I bike everywhere, the bus stops do not have trash cans. So that's where you see a lot of trash and it's all from fast food restaurants because people are eating, waiting for the bus and they get on the bus and there's nowhere to put their trash. So that's just an observation that could be easily handled. But my other question was, how do we know which businesses are ocean friendly? Do they have a sticker or how are they identified? Yeah, good question. So they do on their door, they, sh they should have a decal. And then inside they have a plaque. So we give them a plaque that designates them. And, and because it's become so popular, we have a star program now as well. It used to be, you know, if you didn't give out a straw and now it's full on, you know, do you compost, do you, you know, whatever. So there's a huge list of things that uh, different ones are doing. Some of it's difficult, right? If you're a, a smoothie shop, it's really hard to avoid the straw, but you could, you know, use a compostable straw, right? So, um, but yeah, that's how we do it. So look on the website and then also look for the decal on the door. Um, okay, thank you. I wanted to mention what you just said, and this might be something we could think about doing together, uh, you know, our groups. Because I, I noticed that too, there's a bus stop right outside where I live and they won't put a trash bin because somebody will have to empty it, right? So, you know, we'll just let whoever pick it up. But I was thinking, could we design some funky fun, just just put a couple of them out that are like um, like a fish, you know, some kind of encashment and, it's, and it fills up, make it so it's big, but then you can also see what's inside of it. As, as just kind of a, a way to address exactly what you're saying, right? So this is how much trash we picked up. We put this out there on such and such a date. This is how full it is, you know, as, you know, keeping a track of it that way. And then it's full of trash. It can be used as a sculpture. It could be used as a conversation piece. So not that we are going to forever take that on, but wouldn't it be great to bring that to attention and then to make sure that there are waste bins and they are managed because you're absolutely right. Those are some of the worst spots and it's all single, you know, single fast food stuff. And did you have a question? Yeah, I had a, a question and a comment. Bonnie, what um, do you know, what research is being done on how to deal with the soup part of the, the degraded plastic? Um, that just seems impossible, you know, from a, a current technology standpoint. The comment that I wanted to make was that I want to share this, um, and I'm glad it's being posted, um, with uh, Mark Kassman, who's coming down tomorrow, as a matter of fact, to do a, uh, sur a uh, scoping trip for Administrator Regan's visit here in September when the Commission on uh, Environmental Cooperation, which is United States, Mexico, and Canada, when they have their annual meeting here in Wilmington in September. Yes. So, yeah. So I just talked to Mark yesterday about my course, and he said he was coming down this weekend. So this is a perfect opportunity to share with him your research. And also to sort of, because I, I think they're planning on doing some um, uh, uh, field trips uh, in the area with, oh, yes. uh, with the international visitors. So uh, I want to get your stuff out in front and center. Thank you. I'll take it. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned, Anne, about the microplastics in the ocean. 
because there are people that are coming up with ideas. And in fact, I just saw a video where there this specially designed boat's gonna skim the ocean and pick up all the plastic. And I believe they're gonna do uh, plastics to energy. Um, I really studied it and there's only one concern that I have and that is the way they have it designed, they're actually gonna be scooping up the plankton as well. And you, no bueno, like it's not worth it because that plankton is so vital to the whole building block of, of the food systems in the, in the ocean. So not a great idea. And in fact, you know, the ocean will clean itself up. And you can tell because I just showed that video, right? This was not plastics that were broken up by man. This is actually the ocean that broke up these plastic particles and then it washed it back in. So beaches do provide a second chance at getting some of this debris. And my hope is that we will fall in love with microplastics like we have um, sea glass, because if we have people picking up these little pieces of plastic because they think they're pretty and put them in a jar, that's a, that would be a great answer. And then we would probably get rid of the problem much faster. Um, unfortunately, that's probably the only way to do it sustainably. And if we had everyone just, you know, doing their part at picking up the plastic pieces, that I mean, there's seven billion of us, right? So we we have an army, um, and then really just everyone picking up stuff when you see it. Even I know it's COVID time, but figuring out a way to to get rid of the trash that you see in the environment, because each piece of trash can be million pieces of plastics if left in the environment. And be sure to follow, you know, Plastic Ocean Project on Facebook as well as Keep River Watch. We do, we both both organizations do cleanups all the time, and uh, everyone is always more than welcome to join in the fun. Um, Surfrider does as well in our region. Um, I, I think that's probably the most. Uh, oh, Keep New Hampshire beautiful, obviously. Um, so all well, these groups. Uh, I, I think it's cleanups. interesting to try to take this inland because everybody basically has a coast. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, if you if you clean up in the interior, it never gets to the ocean. And so, what I tell my students is, if you're in a landlocked country, and you know, you can still do an ocean cleanup. Uh, so I think we need to expand it beyond just the beaches uh, and that when we have World Ocean Day or whatever that we encourage, you know, uh, 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 market it as an ocean cleanup, even if you live in, you know, Hendersonville or whatever. Yeah, I agree. And in fact, the image behind me is part of a, a five piece series. Um, I, so I got a small grant to take my art exhibit that represented my research in the ocean. And the grant request was for um, money to take it to landlocked areas, right? Because rivers lead to rivers that lead to the ocean. So we're all part of the problem. And and we're all part of the solution, right? So whenever I brought my, whether it was Salt Lake City or wherever my art exhibit was, we always did a river cleanup. And, um, and that really was awesome because people don't realize it, right? Until you get out there and you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much trash, you know? And I'll never forget when I was in Reno, um, we were doing a cleanup and there was a fisherman and, uh, he walked over to me and he had his arms full of trash. He saw what we were doing. He put down his pole and he like picked up a bunch of trash. And he's like, here, take this. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, it is, and it, it, it is inspiring and as well as um, people catch on and they want to be a part of doing something good. So there's the, the visual of picking up stuff as well. There's a question in the chat, Bonnie, I'm gonna read. Um, it's talking about microplastics in uh, byproducts of washing your clothes. What can be done about that source? Um, yeah, so there's, there's now new technology that's out that you can actually affix this filter to your washing machine. I actually had a woman who has one of these devices bring it to me, Jan Farmer. Um, so she brought it to me and then she's like, can you analyze what we found, you know, what, what's in there? But it was about a month's worth of fibers that she collected. 
So we can all do our part that way. We can't wait for the government anymore. It's completely commandeered by corporations. So we have to be the answer to these problems. And that's a really good one. Now, again, you know, you're just gonna throw it in your garbage, but at least it's sequestered. If we bury it, it's gone and it's not gonna end up in our rivers that end up in our plankton. So that, that's just one of the solutions. They also have, you know, what we have in our dryers, another way of capturing, capturing these fibers. Um, looking for natural fibers for our clothing, right? So moving away from synthetic, um, that like rayon, unfortunately, which is a really nice material, but it is plastic, right? So understanding that the natural materials are much better for the environment, but also, you know, cotton has a lot of chemicals in it. So then, you know, going with a more organic cottons are also important. So just, it's a lot and it's expensive, but um, sometimes less is more, you know, spend more money on really quality clothing and then it's less likely to, slough off or cause harm. Thank you. And there, the, there, there's a further question about, you know, sharing where you can buy one. I, I, I think uh, a quick Google search of, um, you know, filters, washing machine, remove plastic from washing machine, something like that, you'll probably come up with a bunch of, I don't think, um, uh, you know, we're going to be providing the um, links to, to corporations right now on this on this page, but yeah. Um, so Ed, I think Ed has a question. Hi, Bonnie. Good morning. Have you spent uh, some time in focusing on the global warming issue, um, and what is that a part of what you're doing with your project, or is that a new thought that you have going? <clears throat> Great question. I'm so glad you asked that because um, I had kind of already figured out that plastics actually leach a lot of chemicals. So that plastic, that video that I showed you with the microplastics in Hawaii, I actually took a meter square of them. So I have a bin of them. And every time we pop off the top, it just releases this god awful smell, right? It's literally off gassing. So you would think over time, because these plastics have to be very old, anywhere from 10 to 60 years old, right? They've been in the ocean a long time, um, that they would eventually, it would deplete the chemicals, but they don't. And in fact, the older the plastic is, the more it leaches out these chemicals. And one of the chemicals is methane. And we know because we had tested it with, um, with an instrument at UNCW, but we didn't quantify it or qualify. We just recognized that it was there. So a, a, a student at uh, University of Hawaii Hilo did a study and they actually determined that plastics are adding methane to the environment, which is 22 times more potent than CO2. So all that plastic, all that plastic lawn furniture, all those plastic parts to our car, all of that is releasing methane. So it is really important that we do keep this plastic out of the environment for that reason as well. So um, in the end of the month, I am going to be going to Alaska. We're going to be collecting uh, plastics. We're also going to be quantifying the off-gassing of these plastics that are actually mostly from uh, Fukushima when that happened. Um, and we're also going to be bringing a Geiger counter to see if those plastics are also uptaking any of the radiation. And work that was done by Captain Charles Moore about two years after Fukushima, we were able, he was able to detect radiation in the plastics. And so we are going to see if it's actually gotten worse. And then is plastic a service that way where we actually can remove some of that radiation? So there's lots to learn about this plastic crisis but most definitely from when we extract the oil all the way to disposal, there's huge carbon footprint for that as well. So yeah, it's definitely playing a role in climate change. I have a question, Bonnie, relative to that. What, what do you think we can do? Um, from my perspective is always like just reduce, you know, like the, the 
if we reduce consumption, we don't have to worry about this recycling problem. And, and that's then right. If we reduce consumption. We don't let the oil companies continue to, to just keep making bank off of these, these, this, you know, this climate issue and plastic issue. And so what is, what do you think a regular person can do other than reducing their consumption, just not buying plastic and you right. know, just possible in terms of somehow getting our voices heard to, to the oil and gas industry and the you know legislators statewide, what is the request there around the fact that you mentioned earlier in your presentation about how you know oil is shifting from obviously fuel is 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 not the best market anymore for them. So they're shifting to plastics. They're doing a lot of marketing around this. And it's you know it's it's hard to say how do, how do you fight that? So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, that's not a fight that I take on directly, but I do work with Nina Butler from More Recycling. And in fact, she just gave a talk for OPEC and she is surprised that they're recognizing that they have to do something. There's such a movement now with fighting this plastic. So while they found their solution in plastics, the rest of the world is like, no, no, we wanna reduce our use of plastic. So they're trying to figure out their role in, in how they can still make plastic, but make it so that it's not demonized anymore. And how can they do that, but to help build this infrastructure? Because I, I don't say that we should never recycle, that is not the answer, but we have to build a better infrastructure in order to make it more recyclable. And think about it, we'll create so many more jobs, right? So if we reduce the chemicals, we make it easier to recycle, we can then have places for these plastics to go. And, and part of it is looking at seeing what other people are doing. So like more recycling. Uh, what my contribution for her is that I provide her the data with the research that we're doing and the work that you're doing, right? I'm, you are probably sitting on an incredible mountain of research that you've done on this plastic that you've collected in different areas. So now you can find places to share that with our local leaders, as well as our state leaders and even our federal government. You know, I, I used to go to DC once a year and sit down with our legislators and talk about what I'm doing. You know, we think that we can't do that. We're just, you know, just an everyday Joe. But it's actually us, you know, we are the government and we have to really uh, shift our focus on who really has the power. And we certainly have none if we don't use our mouths and if we don't write letters. So I can't encourage you enough to start getting more involved with your government and those things that you care about. You can't care about all of it. I mean, you can, but it'll, you, know, you won't sleep at night. Um, but there are things that you're really passionate about and get behind that. Find the people that are doing that work and then figure out how you can even get people to write letters or even take a trip up to DC and visit your people. Thank you. Um, okay, does there anybody else who has any questions or comments before we let let Bonnie have the rest of her Saturday and, and everybody can it, it looked ready. like Ed had his hand up. I don't know. I think that was his question that we just answered. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I hope, um, you know, after this, we, you know, we can all kind of go away with a little bit more of acknowledgement and recognition of, of what's out there at the grocery store and, and look underneath the plastic and see what it is. And, and if you, if you cannot buy it, don't buy it. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, so true, Dana, you know, if it's sometimes it, they're hard choices, but I'm finding, you know, I used to be one of those people that I, I would um, go get two cups of Dunkin' Donuts a day in a, in a medium cup, not a small and never a large. I wanted it out of the styrofoam cup. This is me before Plastic Ocean Project, two a day. And, um, and then when I got involved in this and I had to bring my own reusable mug, um, I started to realize that I didn't even really like the coffee. And then I had a thought, like maybe I was addicted to the styrene that was being released into my coffee. I mean, because I, I used to literally crave it, like I had to have it. And so when you start you know, either denying yourself or you know, shifting how you eat and not buying stuff that's packaged, um, you start to eat and drink better. 
you know? So there's, there's, there's that benefit as well. Absolutely. And um, I did put a link in the chat for um, when, when, when Bonnie was mentioning what is recyclable and what's not, check that out, New Hanover County site. And, and if you get a chance to take a tour with Joe Salaman um, at, at the landfill, it is an amazing tour and he does help to, to sort of shed light on this issue, um, you know, economically on recycling and, and, and what they're facing over there and how we can help. Um, yes. And I, and I would like one more comment and yeah, that is please. to say that we are so blessed to live in the community we live in. First of all, as you had mentioned, all of the nonprofits, we all work very well together and that that is a coup in itself. But also what our, what our uh, waste management system is, is pretty amazing. We have a compost facility, which every single municipality should own. Like that is so important. And if you live outside of New Hanover County, you should be really pushing your municipality to get one because it helps offset what's ending up in the landfill and, and also it's uh, um, methane that's being released right so and it's turned into a resource so that's one thing and then we do have a recycling facility here which most places don't have so we do have that feature and we have joe S solomon who is one of the best like he is so open for people to contact him and to teach about what they do and um, and he's always looking for ways to improve the landfill. And the other thing we have is a, a recycling construction materials facility as well. So there's a lot of materials that are brought to the landfill like sh roof shingles and wood and cement. And we also have that recycled. So really should praise how well we are doing here in this community. And And you know, sometimes we, we don't need to shame so many people is maybe just really um, give a shout out to those that are doing great things. And it could be as much as just watching a kid pick up a piece of trash and telling them thank you. I love that. It's a great way to end the conversation. Um, and thank you so much, Bonnie and everyone else. Um, a reminder, this is recorded and you, it will come out in an email on Wednesday in your email that you receive from Cape for River Watch because you're all signed up for the emails from Cape for River Watch. <laughs> and uh, it's also going to be on our website and it, and it will be on Facebook immediately. So if you're into Facebook, um, it'll as soon as we end this, they basically save them up there. You can feel free to grab it and share it around. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie, for all you do and for taking the time out this Saturday morning to talk with us about it. And thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks. See you thank all you at all. 4 p.m. at Waterline today. Waterline, I'll be there. We got new shirts. We'll be we'll be asking for donations to set. We got new shirts. Wait, wait here somewhere. Oh, I like Woo. it. Yeah, so and all kinds of great things. So hopefully we'll see you all there. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank right. you. You're everyone. welcome. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, Bye Anne. Great to see you.